The presentation you're about to enjoy is part of Humanities Washington's Speakers Bureau programs. Humanities Washington is a nonprofit organization dedicated to sparking conversation and critical thinking, and it provides many other cultural programs to hundreds of thousands of people throughout Washington each year. Thanks to support for the National Endowment of the Humanities, the Boeing Company, Washington Secretary of State, many private donors, Humanities Washington's Bureau Speaker, Speakers Bureau presenters visit all corners of the state. I would encourage you to visit their website, www.humanities.org, to find other events like this one. Thanks also to Arts Washington, Whatcom County Library System, the Lummi Island Library, Lummi Island Heritage Trust, and the Friends of the Island Library. My name is Janine Shaw. I'm a board member of Friends of the Island Library and the Lummi Island Heritage Trust. I am working this evening with Brooke Peterson, our Lummi Island Library Manager, and Ann McAllen, the Adult Programming Coordinator of Whatcom County Library System. A note on civil discourse. The Speakers Bureau program is designed to generate an open and honest conversation on many topics, some of which may be viewpoints, but we also ask that you treat this topic, the speaker, and each other with respect. A few housekeeping items. The program will last approximately 50 minutes, five zero minutes. It will begin with 30 minutes of reading by our guest, Rena Priest, followed by questions uh, that you may enter on the Q&A portion of your computer. Uh, we cannot take, of course, every question, but we will try to bundle the questions so that we answer as many in the topic uh, as possible. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Rena Priest. Rena Priest is a poet and an enrolled member of the Lockdomish Nation. She has been appointed to serve as Washington State's Poet Laureate for the term of April 2021 to 23. She is also the recipient of an Allied Arts Foundation Professional Poets Award. Her debut collection, Patriarchy Blues was published by Moonpath Path Press and received an American Book Award. Her second collection, Sublime Subliminal, is available from Floating Bridge Press. Individual poems are featured at poets.org, Poetry Northwest, A Dozen Nothing, and elsewhere. Priest has also published nonfiction in High Country News, Yes, Magazine, Nautilus, and Adventures Northwest. She is the National Geographic Explorer 2018 through 2020 and holds an MFA from Sarah Lawrence College. Learn more at renapriest.com. And now, without further ado, Rena Priest. I'm so pleased to be here with you this evening, um, uh, especially in this venue, which would be the Lummi Island Library if we were all meeting in, <laughs> in real life. And um, I think that that would be just a very special place to be. So I'm going to imagine that I'm there with you all now. And um, it's kind of funny when we were talking about how the events are announced as being an hour and 45 minutes normally. <laughs> it's having to do with the ferry um, so that, you know, people can, you know, the event will take place and then people will continue to congregate at the library waiting for the ferry to come. <laughs> so um, I thought, wow, it's been a long time since I've thought about the ferry. The Lummi Island Library is actually um, special in my family. My grandma used to run away to the Lummi Island Library. She lived at the top of the hill um, near the ferry dock. And so people would go 
to see her and the car would be gone or the car would be in the driveway and everything would be open but my grandmother would be gone <laughs> and they'd say where's Rena I'm named after my grandmother and they'd say where's Rena and it turned out that she had gone off and ridden the ferry across to the Lenny Island Library and you know spent the afternoon there in sort of a sanctuary so she was also a poet and this is mentioned in some of the interviews that I've given um, and people often would like to know more about that, but she, um, this is one of her poems. Um, <clears throat> I was encouraged to start off readings with poems by other people. And so here it is, Catch My Branch, her little chat book that she made. I'll read her poem. One, women in wellness guided by sincere elders. Every breath is a prayer, short of breath, but empowered by wisdom of being a woman, images and happiness in my medicine bag. Two, faces. The image of all native women's faces nourishing each woman for my medicine bag, the strength, humor, shyness, the comforter, support of each other, putting colorful images of happiness in my medicine bag, renewing my life and spirit. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Three, yes. Excuse me, this is what 62 is supposed to look like, dancing through the trails, dancing in the heart and spirit. Thank you for being a mother, father, spirit. Four, open with the life of a female eagle, choosing your mate for life until you have that strength to catch my branch, proving you can be my right wing. I am a woman of wellness. I am a woman of too much. I am a woman of not enough. Girlfriend, give him a branch to top the tree, to make a strong family tree, a woman of unending vision. Five, importance of wellness in the men we have not, and importance of wellness in the men. We have not been here. We have not been there. We have been in boarding school, the wars, the battered causes. Importance of continuance of natives, understanding the pain of being a man, boy crossing over to being a man, Looking at the broken chain, tears washing the toxins out, becoming warriors, warrior boy becomes a man, to be gentle, strong worker, playful, full of fire, love, wisdom, alone together, to make a change, honor the warriors, to honor the women. Six, sacred mountains, world mountains, speaking to each mountain, communicating, I am a woman who can move mountains. Fight for women in wellness. Seven, in Indian country, wellness and sharing native roots, medicines, right? Looking for the good in having your full cup, right? Celebrating life in Indian country, turn around and look at the good. So um, I, a lot of people say that I'm her namesake for a reason that we're a lot alike and um, and I think that that's just a very high compliment. <laughs> so I just wanted to start with that. And then another reason that this um, reading at Lummi Island would be special if we were all there in person is because um, my family has a long history with that island, not just like pre-history, uh, pre like written history, but also um, within the last seven generations. I'm from the Lane family, um, who is descended from the Lane family on my grandmother's side, who's descended from the Frederick Lane um, that Lane Spit is named after on Mummy Island. But before that, we called the island the Mummyek, um, which means deer, because it was where the deer were uh, left to reproduce to provide food for our people. All of the islands had a purpose. Um, and I'll talk a, a little bit more about that later when I read um, some of my later poems. But I think I'm gonna move chronologically through the reading and start with poems from Patriarchy Blues, which are the oldest poems. I'll just read a few from here. And then I'll move into Sublime Subliminal, which are um, poems that were published in 2018. And then I'll read some new poems for you. Okay, from Patriarchy Blues. Toward a beautiful flare of ruin. Is safety crippling better to be a fierce and hungry and angry thing of tastes and moods and tempers, to devour, to long for achingly, 
to walk in between, to hide from oneself, to hide from others. <clears throat> Excuse me, that is scratching my throat. <laughs> um, to hide from others, to indulge and set free and destroy, to wish harm on and take it back, to wish not to wish harm on, to howl and wander, shameless of the appetites and the failure to desire to curb them, to follow the cravings illicitly, to follow knowing where they lead, or turn the desires away and open the heart to fall prey to hunger and lack and jealousy and shame and meanness, to lose touch with the fluidity of the spirit, to find new desires and cultivate tastes for the sunrise, to trade the sweetness of transient pleasures for the steady sweetness of your own voice, to be destroyed and rebuilt by song. Um, so that's the opening poem of Patriarchy Blues and it takes its title toward a beautiful flare of ruin from a passage in Donna Tartt's book, The Goldfinch, which is a really wonderful piece of literature. Desire is a scissor. Desire is a scissor searching for us at the ends of loose threads, tugs, unraveling into a luster, a bliss-faced blush across 17 muscles to smile and 43 muscles to frown, unraveled into a dazzle, a tuft of down, swirling from the apex where none can plant their flag. It holds us, this shine muck electric fence, we hold it for the jolt and throb of fingers buzzing in our blood, the spool unwound, bound up in new scenes. We find we can't let go, even for life. It is a parallel striped longing leading off into the distance, so far off that the two lines seem to join at the horizon, but never really do. They just stay the exact same distance apart. It is the inadequable distance of want. What does it mean, little guru, this lopsided enlightenment, the night's firmament collapsing into a single hot moment? Does it dull your senses forever? And then I'll read two more from this collection and we shall move on. Let's see here. I will read one more from this collection and move on. This one's called Nail Salon. The colors shimmer in rows along the walls like springtime on shrooms, a conundrum conjuring variety, glistening like an impossible city. Choice is always a factor in happiness. The more choices we're given, the greater our capacity for dissatisfaction. It's okay. There's always red, but then there they stand, a selection sorted aside, sorted in their suggestion. Snake's tongue, Granny used to call painted nails. Poesis, I say, the name to make the shade. Fishnet stockings, red. Freaky Friday nights, red. Gypsy girl, red. Vodka and caviar, red. Drive church ladies insane with envy, red. Cat fight, red. Will somebody please pay attention to me, Red? All this, and still, I can't find a shade to fit the statement that I want to make. This predatory capitalist patriarchy is killing me, and I'm trying to learn to like it. Why have I never seen that shade in here before? Probably the labels are too small, so they call it girl, just gamboge, and forget it. So, uh, those are fun poems. It's fun to go back and see uh, work that you did a long time ago and work that you maybe haven't engaged with for a little while. See how you've changed and how, it, how different it is from the work you're doing presently. Um, so Luminal was uh, just totally a whole different animal from Patriarchy Blues. And I actually wrote it um, as a way to fall in love with language again. So there's a lot of wordplay. Um, it might seem to go fast, just kind of enjoy it for the, the sonic uh, little, for the sound. Sublime, subliminal, 
The bridge is cerebral and phrenic, a mysterious reflex. When you put it to your lips, it is lexical. You convulse. The bitterness is extra, like an impulse to discuss politics at length. But the aftertaste is the touch of your tongue to the silky dream spun by Remedios Varro. There is cooing in your amygdala. A feather falling from the balcony conjures the scent of Nag Champa. It is arousal. It is stimuli, to which you respond instinctually. Dig west, young Jim, says the scrawl in a grand central terminal tunnel. Then suddenly, dirt under your nails is trending, transitional, initial, impending. Just give us a decision task, and we will act exactly as the officers of thought say we ought. But between you and me, a tunnel is also a bridge. Each maintains a position on both sides of a threshold. I know it is we who control the water, but the storms are deviants governed by our demons. Kitty cat, you shall strut the psyche like a catwalk, stylishly, quietly unite the shores. Calladita se ve mas bonita is what the storm lords give as their excuse to call the flood. But we use love and math to build a span with cadenary curves and harmony with the universe. The bridge is spiritual and tangible. It holds up. It comes across on breath, our sacred verbal cable. So uh, that is my homage to poetry um, and how it really is a bridge between the psyche and the page and between one person and another. Um, I also was invited to speak to the University of Washington Information School um, to their graduating class, people graduating with a master's in information or a master's in library and information sciences. And I thought, what can I say to these smart people? <laughs> um, and so I used this poem as an example of how poetry can be an archive. There are several memories and several um, bits of information sort of encoded in this, in all the poems in this collection. And I've been meaning to write a companion um, collection to go, you know, with it so that there are like the magic decoder ring after each poem talking about what each thing is. Um, but things like, um, uh, you know, the feather falling from the balcony, there's cooing in your amygdala. That was, that was a moment that I wanted to keep and um, has special meaning to me, but then also things like um, the line, dig west, young Jim, says the scrawl in a Grand Central Terminal Tunnel. That was something that I would see when I lived in New York and I would take the train in um, three or four times a week at least. And sometimes I would pass through a tunnel where there was some graffiti that said, dig west, young Jim. And I thought, oh, that's funny. It's like a play on that phrase, go west, young man. And I thought, I wonder if they know the history of like west, westward expansion and how disastrous that was for American Indians. Um, you know, like I think we're just not taught the, the true history in schools. And um, so I thought, well, I'll put it in a poem and maybe someday I can talk about it. <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> All right. So a couple more from this collection and I'll try not to talk so much with read, but uh, let's see here. Song of the Blue Cricket. Your face is a trapdoor to euphoria. I see you, I wanna see more of you. Your face is a bell. I salivate, secrete secret lusts that taste like abiding bliss, a sweet yet refreshing mix of melons and lemons grown by nymphs. Your face is relentless. I can't forget how it feels like the lanate riff of metal from a germanium fuzz face petal. I skip across the surface of your glance, then sink into its rippling silence. Eons later, I wash ashore smaller, softer, in ways that break like laughter from the crowded cabarets of Montparnasse. I go there to ask Alice Prynne about the photograph. 
Was man a chimper when he caught her likeness in his light bucket? Your face relents. I forget how it feels, and so I yield to the urge to yield. The length of a snake is the snake's secret until it's dead. The blue cricket of transcendence keeps a measuring tape under his bed. He says, darling, dry your tears, and ever hence we'll live in temples where ample residual resin smolder in unused confessional. Let the soul dangle like a circus aerialist on a thread, a spider on the ceiling, your gaze. Is it a safety net or a web? So each of these poems has a foreign language phrase and um, a slang phrase and a piece of language that I've never heard before and uh, the name of a famous person. And so um, they all kind of braid together into something. The foreign language phrase, qu'est-ce que c'est bruit une éclat de rire, is French for what is that noise, a burst of laughter. And I probably am butchering the French, but <laughs> thank you for bearing with me on that. Um, the, the slang in this poem, I really uh, kind of love. <laughs> it's, um, it's a uh, chimper, which is a photography slang for a photographer who, when he takes his pictures, he says, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> I thought that was kind of fun um, when I learned that. And I had my picture taken by a kind of a well-known photographer today. And I shared that with him and he kind of loved it. And he kind of blushed. He said, I do that. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Um, all right, so, oh, and it also has a, if you can work it in, each of these poems will have a proverb. And the proverb here is, the length of a snake is the snake's secret until it's dead. And that's a Russian proverb for, you never know how bad a problem is until you come, like until, you know, it reveals itself at the end. Um, but that was pretty good. So we'll do, one more from here. We'll do a fun one. We'll do Canadian tuxedo. Your kiss is backlit pixelation. It's a problem of creative visualization that makes it taste like data and absence. Your presence in the flesh suggests an imbalance of electrical charges that makes my hair stand on end. When your hand touches my hand, a soothing sandalwood scent sends electrons through the length of me, makes me believe that you are, in fact, an ingenious invention of Mr. Van de Graaff. I run my hand along your sleeve, and when we kiss the air between us, enters the fourth state of being, returns to normal with an audible spark. Flannel's Canadian silk, you say. This is a Kenora dinner jacket. The thing about electrons, they make capricious friends. But don't worry about your odds. Roy Sullivan will tell you all about 1.21 gigawatts. You will tell me that denim on denim is a Canadian tuxedo, but hip thrust and a wardrobe mix up caused the American king to wear it best. Elvis has left the building and now I'll never get to wear a purple flannel bridal dress. I push my pinky finger through thousands of miles of fiber optics, make connection my favorite project. Babe, pita la coupe de foudre. The drunken monkey of truth says, it's too late for you to never tell me you love me, but I've already tasted in your kiss the pixels of lightning you keep in your lips. So as I mentioned that a poem can be an archive, this one's sort of the archive of, um, the second date that I had with my husband at the Spark Museum here in Bellingham. And um, he's Canadian. He would probably hate it that I'm sharing about him. He's so shy. But, um, you know, it's, it's kind of fun. Roy Sullivan is the famous person in this poem, and he's famous for being struck by lightning 11 times and surviving. And then the slang is, uh, of course, from Back to the Future, 1.21 gigawatts. <laughs> I love that scene, Doc Brown. Okay, um, so now I'm going to read a, a newer poem that I wrote. 
bear with me. I'm going to open it up on a computer because it's not published anywhere yet. So uh, here we go. Okay. Apologies. So it's um, a collage poem that I wrote for uh, resources. They had a fundraiser and it was a really beautiful event and they invited you know, the community to participate when they, when they registered um, to attend the event. They invited the community to leave a sentence or a word or a phrase about why they live in the Pacific Northwest and why they love it here. And then they asked me to braid the responses together into a poem. And I thought, okay, sure. And then I saw that like 200 people registered for this event. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, that's gonna, be a, that's gonna be a challenge. But luckily a lot of people love a lot of the same things about this place. And so um, there were some repeats and they gave me really good material to work with. There were some, I think, natural poets who submitted lines and um, ended up just kind of sending sending me some good material to work with. And I was able to braid probably at least 80% of what was sent together um, from those responses from the 200 registrants. And the poem is called The Source. We are in a beautiful dynamic natural world, walking in the sweetness of cedar forests and sea salt laden mist, nature and soul touching. We are all interconnected. I love the rain, lands, and beautiful waters, orcas and salmon so close to home, the rich coast, Salish culture, native caretakers of the wild, flowing integrity of living waters. Nature is all around me and we are all trying to protect it, to enjoy it, to be renewed, to share it, abundant, lush life abounds, there is beauty all around. Lummi tradition, roots, indigenous protectors, intersection of earth allies for all living things. I was born here to so much beauty and vitality, ecotopia, connection, community, the breeze, trees, mountains, streams, the ocean, love thy nature, lush life where salt water meets the mountains, soul peace, salmon streams, salt water in that west coast vibe, Mountains, rivers, oceans, salmon, community, hope from rainforests to sagebrush prairies, our Salish Sea home nourishes mind, body, and spirit. I love the crackling of our beautiful spark as the underside of its leaves catch the play of light reflected off the water. I love the landscape, its majesty, mystery, and magical quality, inspiring us to become a restorer species. Lush life, friendliness, and greenness bountiful natural inspiration. Into the forest I go to renew my soul, beauty in every direction, nettles, thimble berries, salmon berries, alders, community of people and trees, peace and tranquility of nature. It is my homeland, this is home, clouds, sunsets, otters chasing cutthroat, while herein stock whatever they stock, an eagle watches it all from above, the natural beauty, it is peace and I love the scenery, sensibility, sensitivity, sanity. I love the air, the water, the people of this beautiful region. Exploring beaches as the tide rises and falls, we can watch the stars in the sea where moon jellies launch in a wet galaxy. The mountains and sea all within reach, sea stars and madrona trees, salmon fighting their way upstream to complete the circle of life breathing the air, mountain air, fresh air, amid the breathtaking beauty of tall trees, old growth forests, moss covered limbs, snow covered mountains, 10,000 foot glacier covered volcanoes. It's all about the snowy mountains, beautiful rain and sailing seas, gifts of rain and snow, clean air, colors out my window, the grasses, brush and understory, trees small and large, distant lush foothills, blue and white sky, Nature's brilliant, numerous lichens, camas and wildflowers, hands in the dirt, the possibility of regenerative agriculture, 
I cherish living among human, plant, and animal people, the Salish Sea and all its wondrous inhabitants, close and connected, received by spirit of place and all residing beings. This is home, the beauty, a homecoming. So <laughs> that one's kind of a <laughs> big breath. <laughs> um, and uh, I think that puts me at 30 minutes. So if you would like to ask questions or request a poem that you might know of mine that I haven't read or I, um, I'm up for whatever you're up for. So we do have, uh, we do have a question, uh, Rena, but first may I say thank you so very much. And perhaps she'll read another from Brittany says, I love collections in which the poems are all woven together with similar themes, forms, etc. How did you go about choosing what the poems in Sublime Subliminal would have in common? The famous person, the foreign language, the proverb, the slang. Yeah, so that was an invented form by an Arizona poet named Jim Zimmerman, um, and it's called 20 Little Poetry Projects. And the collection actually started out, um, I was in residence at Mineral School here in Washington near Mount Rainier, and I was there to write a memoir. <laughs> that was the project that I proposed. And so I was trying so hard. I would, you know, sit and I would write and write and write and write. And it was hard writing because, you know, writing about your life in nonfiction prose is, is sometimes daunting and so I you know you're like oh this is so hard and I you know rather than kind of get stuck and feel stuck I I'd say, I'm gonna go write a poem and like kind of I was doing it as like an exercise to make the gears start turning in a way towards like beauty and celebration of language to kind of help myself feel better and then uh I ended up having this <laughs> little stack of poems when I left um, and no memoir. <laughs> um, so I still have pieces of the memoir, but I think probably I'll wait until, you know, I, I can move in, uh, you know, there'll be a time for that. But um, yeah, this poem kind of came together, just or this collection came together just kind of by happenstance. Avoidance. <laughs> <laughs> We have another po uh, question from Michael. Uh, I recently got a poem for Poem in Your Pocket Day. It was written by a Lummi youth. How did this all come together? So uh, when I found out that I was going to be Poet Laureate, um, it was a long time before any of you found out. and <laughs> It was really hard to keep it a secret, um, but they, you know, they kind of started me in the process of thinking about transitioning into the role in March. Um, and Claudia Castro Luna, the previous poet laureate, she, um, and actually Poem in Your Pocket Day is an, is like a nationally celebrated thing. Um, you can learn about it on poets.org. I think it's been going since 2009, they said, as like, a you know, as something that is done nationwide. Um, but, uh, Claudia, in her tenure as Poet Laureate, made it poetry for everyone. So it's also, it's poetry in your pocket, <clears throat> excuse me, or poem in your pocket, but it's also poetry for everyone. And sh her intention was to have poem excerpts or poets, very short poems by youth poets, and also um, in a language other than English. Which also, I forgot to say, when I was writing Sublime Subliminal, I loved the prompt in 20 little poetry projects that was write a phrase in in a language other than English because you know at the time it seemed like there was a lot of uh sort of meanness happening and hatred about you know people speaking other languages in our country and you know the phrase speak English and I was like oh well we're gonna put something something else in all of these poems. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so so Claudia, she she wanted 
Tuesday. And when I came on board, she said, Rena, can you find a youth poet and then have them translate, you know, can, can you have it translated into Chloe Chawson? And um, I was like, yeah, I could, I could definitely do that. So I put out the call and then um, Sadie actually sent her poem in with a little story about how um, she had written this as kind of like a long running um, poem where at the end of e at the end of the phrase she changes the word that she's talking about to a different word so it'd be haishka 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 es haishka 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 es just thank you thank you thank you thank you for the beautiful water um and she would change the last word to a different word in kolnukhkin so that she could learn the language so water mother father you know at the end of her little her song there or her poem and I thought that was really beautiful um, because it was her learning the language and also um, creating you know like a mnemonic device which kind of heralds back to what poetry was used for originally anyways <laughs> um, pre-writing and um, so I chose that also for the importance of the message and how it resonated with um, the, the the message that I want to put forth in my tenure as poet laureate, which is celebrating the natural world through poetry, one of one of the things I want to do in this role. We had a follow up question: Where can I find the entire poem from Sadie? Um, so it's not written, <laughs> um, and it is just you know as she learns words, kind of um, they go at the end of it again and again and again um, in the tradition of our spoken language, which is interwritten language. We worked with um, Ted Solomon, who is the, the director of our, or the manager of our language program at LAMI, um, to confirm the translation and uh, something that I learned about the etymology in that process is that Heishka is, um, you know, if you break it down the way that he spells it, SXW is you. Thank you. Um, and I thought that was kind of cool that it's like you are embedded in the, the thing in that word. Um, so um, kind of interesting, but it's not a written language traditionally. Um, and I see someone wants the name for Lummi Island. It's Samamiyak. And, and I, I'd have to look, I'd have to double check on the spelling for that because, um, as I said, <laughs> you know, I was spelling Heishka kind of like phonetically all these years with just H Y apostrophe S H Q E apostrophe, and that's not that's not right because we we spell the sh sound S X W. So there's a lot of like intricacies. It it is really like learning a language, but um, to learn the conventions of our language department and how they're trying to adopt um, a, a, an accepted spelling for things. But that's a lot of work. Um, I don't know if a dictionary is in, the, is in the works or not, but hopefully, I mean, <laughs> you know, that's something I'd love to participate in if it is, so, mm -hmm. yeah. We have a question, Rena, from Patrick. He says, can you discuss your poetry writing process a little bit? How do you choose a topic, revise, et cetera? What do you think about as you craft a poem? Yeah, so um, usually, so other than like this, this book, which had the 20 little poetry projects, I would build I would build the project around a theme. So for example, like in Canadian Tuxedo, I wanted everything to kind of be related to um, electricity and the idea of what a Canadian Canadian Tuxedo is, like which is denim on denim. <laughs> um, and who wore that? Well, like Elvis Presley and Alec Baldwin. <laughs> if you look it up on the internet, it's really entertaining. Um, but you know, and then just kind of like built everything else around it. And I had the prompts, of course, um, to help me, but I also wanted them to create like a flow of meaning. 
even if I was the only one who understood <laughs> what that meaning was. Um, but in Patriarchy Blues, I didn't really know what tied these poems together until I, I was talking to my daughter and um, we were, she, she had just taken, um, she'd just been at Bellingham Girls Rock Camp and she was, you know, learning how to play rock and roll and, uh, and they were teaching the girls about the patriarchy. <laughs> And she would come home and she'd have these big, serious, hard questions about, you know, the patriarchy and stuff and, and power imbalances and, and everything, just the whole thing, right? So trying to explain this to a teenage young lady and coming, you know, coming kind of up to my limits and then just like sometimes being like, well, yep, patriarchy is a bummer. <laughs> it's total bummer, right? <laughs> And then it'd be like, okay, well, the, the patriarchy blues. I, it was this quote too. She was also really into jazz, but there's a quote at the beginning of this. It says, I merely took the energy it takes to pout and wrote some blues. And that's Duke Ellington. And I kind of wanted to kind of show her that that is your option. You can pout or you can like make something out of it, um, try to make something beautiful out of it. And so through those conversations, I looked at what I was writing about and I realized that what tied all of the poems in this collection together was somewhat of that sense of, you know, um, women finding their way and rather than pouting, taking that energy and putting it elsewhere. <laughs> So, um, yeah, it, it's art is kind of a funny thing. You start with like disparate pieces and then they find their way to each other and then they become a thing. It's kind of strange, really it's weird, but cool. <laughs> I have a question, Rena. Uh, you have a poem, uh, Super Sacred. Which uh -huh. I don't know if you have time to read, but I really was moved by that poem and all of your poetry. And uh, to me, the poem is very beautiful. Uh, it's got irony and a lot of humor in it, which is in a lot of your poetry. Um, you don't, you're not overtly angry in your poetry that I see. And I just wonder when you just, which I'm, I'm not asking you to be, <laughs> but I just wonder if you can read that poem and talk a little about about how you describe emotions in your poetry. Sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is super sacred from this book, also written as a, as a 20 little poetry project. Super sacred. The super sacred ceremony is a portal to pre-contact. All the songs are time machines, but they only travel to the past. And you have to know how to write a rhythm and a tone. The super sacred ceremony is a succession of inventions receding into oblivion. Smartphones are the first to go. The last is the sense of smell. When you come to the beginning, there's the sense of geosmin, then ozone, then nothing. No more quenching of thirst with the sound of rain. No more salt. The word salt is from the Latin for particle. JK, the word for salt isn't real. The word scent, however, is also a container for thoughts about hunting and lovemaking and lilacs. Vera Rubin, did you ever wonder if dark matter weren't made of women like you quietly doing 90% of the work of holding together the universe, keeping it all from flying apart, just like a family matriarch? The super sacred ceremony requires a night dentist to extract the dark tooth and replace it with gold. This is my real Indian poem, the one the admissions board and a certain readership have been waiting for. Here are some beads, here are some feathers, here is a song and dance that changes up the weather. Here is the requisite mention of mother earth and the moon. Here is a deer with a velvet hide who asks of me with his mind, Indian poem, why you know right? Here is a sacred prayer at sunrise. Here are two eagles in flight and here 
is my forgiveness. The super sacredness of this, my real Indian poem, is going to absolve all white guilt, but only if you buy my book. Grant me admission, say I'm a good Indian, a real Indian. Princess, when anthropologists came to study my tribe, they recorded the phrase, Sui Dun your light is good. Did the old people mean lamplight or heartlight or both? We'll never know. All the songs are time machines, but all the words have changed. So that um, is the only poem in the collection with a, a phrase from Kulnuskin, <laughs> and I got it wrong. Um, I won't tell you how, but it was bound to happen. <laughs> I was just starting to learn that, um, to, to learn our language. And so, oh, well, say lovey, I'll fix it someday. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, that poem I wrote kind of in the last part in frustration about how um, people expect certain types of work and certain things from other people, from, from women and from indigenous people. Um, like, you know, thing, things, T. S. nobody ever asked T.S. Eliot, like, why don't you write about being a white oppressor? You know, like nobody ever asked him that, but people ask me all the time, like, you know, or a misogynist, why don't you write about being a misogynist? Because, <laughs> you know, like he had his wife committed to a mental hospital so he could write poetry. Um, <laughs> but, but people ask me all the time, like, why don't you write about your heritage? Why don't you write about being indigenous? Why don't you write, and you know, uh, about this or that? And it was always like, I <laughs> try to be so polite and, uh, you know, because I write, I, I find it hard to be a woman even more, you know, at the time I was working on patriarchy blues, you know, these layers of things that you have to deal with. If, um, if we're talking about that, it, like I celebrate my indigenous culture. It, it's not something that bothered me enough to put pen to paper <laughs> you know our history definitely but that was too much you know it was it was kind of too too much more than I had skill for at the time I felt um or emotional uh strength for really um but it, it was always kind of like well I write about whatever is kind of in my heart at that moment and so uh I wrote this poem it's also one of my teachers told me, I don't think of you as Indian. And I was like, oh, um, and this was in grad school. And I was like, okay, because you know a lot probably. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I know that I was probably the only native person from like, from a reservation, like a non-Urban Indian, like a, a, the only, I was probably the only reservation Indian who he had ever encountered in his life. And I thought it was kind of interesting for him to say that to me. Um, and it was just like purely from his own stereotypes of what an indigenous person is, right? Because I wasn't writing about our myths or legends or time long ago or, um, you know, angry poems about history or write, expected to write about if you're ever going to be published or thought of as like an authentic voice um, in Indigenous literature. And I still somewhat feel that way. I think that once I started um, writing those poems, but from an authentic place in myself, which I had to come to gradually, that was when people started to kind of go, oh, this is like an indigenous poet, <laughs> you know, even though it wasn't ever a secret, I would, you know, talk about my identity or whatever, if it, if it came up or if it, you know, occurred to me to do so. But anyway, so that's the purpose of writing this poem. And the famous person in there is Vera Rubin. And she was a scientist who worked um, with a partner on, she, she discovered or pioneered um, the work around dark matter, which um, 
is huge and she was never really acclaimed for it her male colleague was the one even though it was really her work um and so I felt like I needed to do a shout out to her as well but you know that you can do work in silence and it's not until you you do the work that's expected of you that people will acknowledge you so anyway <laughs> I don't know if that was a lot but. that's wonderful that's a very thank you we have probably time for one more question and then we'd want to wrap it up um but uh extremely um I see that there's someone asking where my books can be purchased and you can get um sublime subliminal from floating bridge press um, their website is just, I think, floatingbridgepress either .com or .org. And that's a really great organization to support. They do a lot for the art, um, for poetry, actually, in Washington State. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one of our former poets laureate, Kathleen Flanagan, was the editor of Floating Bridge Press, Press for, uh, for years. And um, now it's it's headed by Michael Schmelzer, who's just really wonderful. And I encourage you to check out his work too. We were Jack Straw writers together in 2019. But um, yeah, Floating Bridge Press. And then um, the, the Patriarchy Blues, hopefully by the end of the week, so you don't have to purchase it through Amazon, I'll have a button on my, um, on my webpage where you can order it directly from me. But that's, that's probably going to take me until at least Wednesday. <laughs> so, <laughs> Rena, I want to thank you on behalf of all of the people that attended and those that will uh, look at the recording and on behalf of the uh, Lummi Island Library. And uh, uh, thank you so much for what thank you've you. done and shared and your beautiful, beautiful poetry. Um, thank you so very much. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, Spitsia Manasteta. Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.